Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Let's do that one more time. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. It is a great privilege for us to study God's Word together in His holy place. Amen. Before we begin, I'd like to encourage you all to have your Bibles with you as we study God's Word today. And before we start, let us pray. Once again, Father, we come to you today to, in your holy place. Please be with us so that we'll be able to understand your word and apply it into your, our daily lives. Please be with me so that whatever words I say will only come from you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Quick question here. How many of you have been to Niagara Falls? Can I see a show of hands? Hmm, quite a few people. Well, a story was told about a man by the name of Charles Blondin. I'm sure most of us have heard his story before, as told by Pastor Jasper. So Charles Blondin was a French tightrope walker who was famous for walking the tightrope across the Niagara Falls. Now, this man, he would occasionally walk the tightrope in a sack, blindfolded, and once he even cooked an omelet in the middle of the falls. Just imagine cooking an omelet while you're walking the tightrope. One time he asked the crowd, hey, do you think that I can walk the tightrope by carry with carrying a, man on, by carrying a man on a wheelbarrow? And the crowd was saying, yes, we believe you can do it. But then Charles himself said, who, now who wants to volunteer to be that man in the wheelbarrow? What do you think happened? It's true, no one actually volunteered. Friends, are we like those fans who are watching Charles Bondin? Do we believe in something, but yet when God calls us to do it, we do not want to do it? This morning, I'll be talking about some person who has true faith in God, and that person is Daniel, not my dad, okay? <laughs> to begin, let us visit Daniel chapter two. Let us open our Bibles to Daniel chapter 2. And if you're there, just let me know by saying amen. amen. So a brief summary on Daniel chapter 2. Basically, in Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he wanted his astrologers and wise men to tell him the dream and to interpret the dream. However, had they not told him the dream, Nebuchadnezzar would have killed them all, including Daniel and his three friends. Now, in this situation, we know that Daniel was in deep trouble because he was at risk of getting killed. So when he went to the king, he told the king that he will need time to interpret the dream. And the first thing that he did was to acknowledge God that he has the power to answer Nebuchadnezzar. Let us look specifically at verse 28, Daniel 2, and in verse 28. If you're there, let me know by saying amen. And verse 28 says, But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days, Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. So in this verse, Daniel is telling King Nebuchadnezzar that there is a God in heaven. This means that without a doubt, Daniel fully believed in God that what, no matter the situation, God will be with him. And this trust that Daniel has in God, it can only be attained through prayer, which Daniel has been doing continually. In life, we will never be confident that God will deliver us if we ourselves do not spend the time talking and communing with God. Trust is developed through time, not overnight. The reason why Daniel said what he said in verse 28 is because he himself was able to spend time with God and he himself has experienced this goodness. Now let us open our Bibles to Daniel chapter six. Now, in Daniel chapter 6, there is another king, not Nebuchadnezzar, but who, everyone? Yes, King Darius. This chapter tells us that 
Darius himself established a decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, he shall be cast into the den of lions. That, ver that we can read in verse 7. Now I want you to look at verse 10 in particular. Verse 10 says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did what, everyone? A four time. That word means that Daniel has been praying and having his personal devotion with God continually. This doesn't mean that he was only praying during times of emergency. This doesn't mean that he was only going to pray when he needed it, like when you're going to pray for the food or praying for your birthday or praying for other horrible events that would happen. This means that Daniel's prayer life is not based on situations, but he worshiped God continually, which means that every day Daniel prayed three times, praising God for what he has done in his life. Also, let us look at verse 16. If you're there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Now in verse 16, it says, Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel, and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest, what everyone? He will deliver thee. This means that even the heathen king, such as King Darius, who was a Persian, he knew that, he, that Daniel served God continually. And this means that if we do serve God continually, other people who may not know the truth will know that we are servants of God. Amen? And this reminds me of Ellen White in one of her writings. She said that a man of prayer is a man of power. This means if we pray more often and pray without ceasing, we will have more power to overcome what we have in our daily lives. And so Daniel's success depended so much in his prayer life, not so much in his skills and capabilities that made him the smartest man in Babylon, but it was in his relationship with God that made him successful during his time in Babylon. And we have been told that in th this story, Daniel would rather lose his life than to quench his devotional life. That tells us that Daniel was very dedicated towards his God. And this also reminds me of what Ellen G. White said in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 147. It says, Death before dishonor, or the transgression of God's law, should be the motto of every Christian. And that was the motto of Daniel in his life. Friends, we would all have our times of trouble, like Daniel, and the only way we will ever survive these times is if we can learn from the person who survived it himself. Daniel survived the time of trouble, and the only way the remnant church will be able to survive is if we have a dedication like Daniel. And going back to the quotation I just read, how can we have an experience with God that will make us, that would make us have that quotation as our motto in life. Only when we have a genuine love experience with God, but how is it that we are able to have that experience with God? That experience can only be attained if we ourselves will set the time to have our own personal devotional time and prayer, li prayer life just as Daniel had while he was in Babylon. This will cause us to die rather than to dishonor God through our genuine relationship with God. So what about you, friends? Do we have a genuine relationship with God? Do we have time to have our personal devotion with God every day? Do we have the capability and trust that Daniel had to survive troubled times? Friends, I challenge you to be like Daniel, to spend time with God through our devotion and prayer. If you haven't set, your, if you haven't set a time for this, 
find some time which you consider to be free and use this so that you can have your devotion with God. This way, you will have a stronger relationship with God and you will be able to overcome any situation which comes your way. And so, friends, if you want to have a personal devotion with God and if you want to serve God continually through prayer, I invite you to stand as I close in prayer. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for everything you have done to us. Lord, we have just learned the story of Daniel. Please help us to be like him so that we will be able to survive every situation that comes our way because of you, Lord. Lord, we ask that with this, we will be able to spend time with you more and that we will have a continual serving of you so that whatever we do in our lives, other people may see that we are your servants, Lord. Please help us to keep the rest of the Sabbath holy. Please be with Kevin and Miro as they will be speaking next. May you anoint them with a double portion of your Holy Spirit. And please bless us throughout the rest of this day. Forgive us from all our sins, Lord, because we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone, and God bless. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank the pastors and the board members to, um, for giving us kids a chance to speak today and to share God's word. Okay, the title of my sermon today is called God's Heroine to Save His Rebellious People. Okay. Most of us want to be great, at least better than others. That's why when people want to achieve something, they want to achieve the highest. When they have something, they want to have the best. And when they, got, when they, get rec they want to get recognized as the greatest. That's why some people are okay with having this watch. You know, its quality is it's okay, but the function, it's to tell time. Yet some people want to spend this much money just, you know, to buy something that's the same function, better quality, you know, but it's still same, you know, tell the time. A wise man once said, there are three ways for you to be great. You were born great, you achieved greatness, and you were given greatness. For example, Rebecca Black is a music artist, and you know, her singing talents is it's not that great. It's it's average. But because she was born in a wealthy family that she was able to with the money that the parents had, she was able to produce her music video. And because she was born in the social media era, that it was easy for her to gain fans and become popular. Even though most of the critics say that her song was the worst song of the year. Example, the other example, LeBron James. He was born in an unfortunate situation. He was raised by a single mother. When she had him, she was 16 years old. You know, and because, so they weren't rich, and, but they were very poor. And they keep moving from one place to another because they couldn't stay in one place because the mom didn't have a steady job until the point where she had to send him at nine years old to live with a football coach where he taught LeBron basketball. But because he had the talent and the drive and the integrity to, you know, to keep working, by, he was, by time in high school, he was known as one of the best players of basketball in high school. And that's why he was given the opportunity to right away play in the NBA and that's why he didn't have to go to college first. Catherine Elizabeth Middleton. Before she you know, had a relationship with Prince William, the world didn't recognize her. But after they were married, she was given the title Duchess of Cambridge. So basically, she was given greatness. Now we will see how our heroine found her greatness. Okay. Let's open our Bibles to Esther 1, verse 1 to 11. 
No, because we, I don't have enough time, so I'm just going to give you the summary of it. It says in verse 1, this was the Ahasuerus who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. So for a full 180 days, he had a banquet for all his nobles and officials, so all the important people. And for another seven days, he made another banquet for everyone in the kingdom. Now it was said in those seven days that wine was served. Each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions, so it was free flowing. And because he wanted to show his glory and splendor, the wine that was served was one of the best and was the hardest liquor. When King Xerxes was in high spirits from wine, he commanded to bring Queen Vashti to display her beauty to the people and nobles. Now, the reason why he brought her was to, you can say, show her off. Now, we will see what Ellen G. White says of what's Vashti's decision. Ellen G. White says in Confident Courage, page 243, she knew that wine had been freely used and that Hezuerus was under the influence of the intoxicating liquor. For husband's sake, as well as her own, she decided not to leave her position at the head of the woman of the court. So she declined the king's command because she knew she wanted to protect her honor as well as her husband's honor. It was when the king was not himself, when his reason was dethroned by wine drinking that he sent for the queen. She acted in harmony with a pure conscience. But the king had unwise advisors. They argued it would be a power given to a woman that would be to her injury. So because of the advice that the king's advisors gave to the king, so eventually she was dethroned. There are three things that we can learn from Vashti's experience. The first thing is, stay away from intoxicating things. Drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, coffee, tea, and even soda, because that is not good for our health and it will cloud our judgment. Now the second thing is, be careful who you hang out with. What environment are you in? Like Pastor Jasper once said in the sermon, you know, be careful of you know, your peers because who you hang out with and the environment they're in, it shapes who you are. <coughs> now, Queen, now Hadassah, or later known as Esther, comes into the picture today. So it was said that because Vashti was dethroned, the advisor said, let us make a beauty contest, you may call it, to search for the next queen. Now we all know the story that Esther was eventually you know, chosen as queen. And we all know that from that decision, you know, she was very beautiful because the king would not have you know, chosen a queen who was you know, ugly. And we also know that you know, there's something about her that's different, you know, that because out of everyone, the king chose her. Now, this is where Haman and Mordecai comes to the picture. When Haman was appointed, was promoted, you know, he was very prideful, and so that every time he went out of the palace gates, he expects everyone to bow down to him. Now, we all know the story, there's one man in the entire kingdom that would not bow down to him, and that was Mordecai. Now, you might ask, why didn't he just bow down? I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you're saluting someone, you know, or just, you know, show your respect. But Ellen G. White comments in Prophet and Kings, page 600, Mordecai had done Haman no harm, but had simply refused to show him worshipful reference. So, he didn't... One, he didn't bow down, not because he doesn't respect Haman, or he just didn't want to, you know, like, say, greet him, but because bowing down to him means worshiping him. And there was only one being in the whole entire universe that Mordecai would bow down to, and that is God. Now, to cut the story short, Haman became so angry that he issued a law saying that all the Jews should be killed. For he did not want to only punish Haman, uh, Mordecai, but he wanted to punish his people. When Mordecai told Esther of the law, Mordecai pleaded to Esther to go before the king and to plead for their lives. But Esther was a bit hesitant. Then Mordecai said, don't think that because you are the queen, you will be saved. Because if the people found out that you were Jew, you too will be killed. And this is what Esther replied. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. 
I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Ellen G. White comments, the crisis that Esther faced demanded quick, earnest action. But both she and Mordecai realized that unless God should work mightily in their behalf, their own efforts would be unveiling. So Esther took time for communion with God, the source of her strength. So eventually, she went before the king, and when she invited the king to a banquet, she said, if it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king, together with Haman, come today to a banquet I have prepared for them. And when Haman and the king went to the first banquet, the king was so in love with Esther that he asked that he even offered her half of his kingdom. But Esther replied, if the king regards me with favor, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. So, long, uh, long story short, they went to the second banquet. Esther finally told the king that you know, her people were about to be killed. So Haman was arrested, and the king appointed Mordecai to issue a law. Because back then, in Persian times, if a king issues a law, even the king himself cannot null it. So the king appointed Mordecai, and through Mordecai, he states a law that the Jews may be, uh, may be able to defend themselves from, his, from their enemies. Now, is it only because one man didn't want to bow down that, you know, that the Jews were about to be destroyed yet again? Ellen G. White says in Prophet and Kings, page 600, Satan himself, the hidden instigator of the Shem, was trying to rid the earth of those who preserved the knowledge of the true God. So it's not only because Mordecai didn't want to bow down. It was Satan trying to get rid of God's people. Now, if we go back in Solomon's prayer dedication in 1 Kings 8, when they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you became angry with them, and give them over to their enemies, who take them captive into their own lands, far away or near. And if they have a change of heart in the land where they are held captive, and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors, and say, We have sinned, we have done wrong, we have acted wickedly. And if they turn back to you with all their heart and soul in the land of their enemies, who took them captive, and pray to you toward the land you gave their ancestors, toward the city you have chosen, and the temple I have built for your name, then from heaven, your dwelling place, hear their prayer and their plea, and uphold their cause. So this is not only Solomon's word, because if you go back to Deuteronomy 28, he's actually quoting some of Moses' words, which saying, if you obey the Lord, he will bless you and will protect you. But if you disobey him, he will deliver you to the hands of, his, of, these, of your enemies. Now, did God keep his promise? Under the favor shown them by Cyrus, ne nearly 50,000 of the children of the captivity had taken advantage of the decree permitting their return. The great majority of the Israelites had chosen to remain in the land of their exile rather than undergo the hardships of the return journey and in, and in the establishment of their desolate cities and home. So yes, God did keep his promise. He offered them an opportunity to go back home. But they're the ones that refused because they did not want to go under, did not want to go undergo the hardships of the return journey, and also they did not want to rebuild their lives from ruins, but rather stay in Persia, while where they're where they're living a luxurious life. God offered them a second chance. A score or more of years passed by when a second decree, quite as favorable as the first, was issued by Darius Hystapus, the monarch then ruling. Thus did God in the land of their fathers. The Lord foresaw the troubled times that were to follow during the reign of Xerxes. So God keep, kept his promise for two times. But the children of Israelites, they themselves have put themselves in this situation. Now, God saw beforehand that if they were to stay in Persia, that during the reign of Xerxes, they would undergo through these problems. Now, you, now we might say that you know, if they had obeyed for the first time, the first opportunity that God gave them, we would say that there would have, you know, there would have been a book of Esther, you might say, because they already obeyed God in the first place. 
But because they didn't obey, then Esther had to came into the picture. So the question for us today is, how do we stand in front of calamities? How do we deal with our problems? Do we deal with our problems like Vashti, relying on our own power, or do we rely or be like Esther, turn to God and believe in him that he will deliver us out of our powers, out of our problems? The second one is, why are we facing so many problems? Is it because that we're staying in this world rather than you know, going home like the Israelites? Because LNG White says in the spirit of prophecy that you know, if the church had been faithfully doing their duty, God would have come a long time ago. And you may ask the pastors for more um, detail about this. So my question, so the question for us today is, are we ready to go home or rather stay here a bit longer? Thank you. So, okay, good morning. morning. As of today, I'm going to continue both of my friends' sermon. So the Bible character which I choose is Job. So when you hear the word Job, what comes into your mind? Probably the man of patience, right? Because he was known of a very patient man. So let us see in the Bible. Let us open our Bible to Job 1 verse 1. It says, There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that was perfect and upright and one that feared God and shed evil. So at this one first, at the first book of Job, at the verse first, we already knew that Job was going to be a good character in the Bible. Only from the first verse of the Bible. So, since he was upright to God, since he, since he was faithful to God, God said to Satan, Satan, where have you been? Satan answered, I've been from the world. God replied, have you noticed my servant Job? He's a very faithful servant, you know? And Satan said, yes, I have. But, there's a but, you put a shield onto him. You put a protection. You didn't give me a chance to tempt him. So, God allowed Job to be tempted. So Satan did many bad things to Job. His first temptation was Job, eh, the farm animals was took away. Maybe in our time, it was like our cars, our richness, our money, or something like that, our Mercedes, BMW, Lamborghini, Ferrari, or something like that. <laughs> Maybe suddenly a thunderstorm strike, boof, and our cars, new, 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 something like that. And suddenly, probably us will be like, why did this happen? But Job, when Satan took away the farm animals, Job didn't complain. Job didn't blame God for his curse. So Satan thinks another temptation. He took away his 10 children. So I went to a death funeral. And I saw one coffin, and all these people around the coffin was like crying, weeping, sharing testimonies how good this friend was to him. But yet, it's only one person. What about Job? Job saw 10 person in his own eyes. Maybe it was like to his eldest son, son, I'll miss you. To the second children, the third children, four children, until the ten children. But yet, he didn't complain to the Lord. So Satan, on the other hand, was like, why? This man, I already took away his farm animals. I already took away his children. He didn't complain. What is this man? I must do something else. I got the perfect idea. I'll make him very sick. So Job was very sick. 
He got boils everywhere, here, 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 there, there, somewhere, everywhere in his body. So his wife tell to Job, Job, why don't you say bad words to your God and kill yourself? Job answered, don't act like a crazy woman. <laughs> and then, remember, he also has three friends, his three best friends. They were weeping, they were sad because Job was sick and everything. Their friends said, Job, maybe you did something wrong in the eyes of God. The other friend said, yeah, maybe you did something bad. Or maybe you broke the commandment. Job answered and stands still, no, I am innocent. So after days, days, days go by, Job didn't complain any single word to the Lord. And then the Lord saw that Job succeeded his trial. Job didn't complain, but Job was thankful of his trial. He was success. But there's a main question in this sermon. Why? Why did God himself allow Job to be tempted by Satan? Well, let me give you an illustration. Is there a goal without being purified in the hot, fiery flames? No, right? A goal must be purified in the hot, fiery flames for it to be a shining goal, right? If a goal wouldn't be purified in the fire, maybe it's just like a rock or something else, like a stone or maybe something. It was really unworthy. So let's open our Bible to Job 23, verse 10. It says, <clears throat> But he knows the way that I take. When he had tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job knew that he would be a goal after he succeeded his trial. And it is true, friends. He succeeded his trial. He was very, very, very patience of his three main trials. <coughs> Let's open our Bibles to James 1 verse 2. Uh, James, yeah, James 1 verse 2 until 4. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Verse 3, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Verse 4, but let patience have her perfect word, that ye may be perfect and entire one thing, night thing. So Job was actually being tested. And he succeeded the test. But what does this story affect us, the people of the end time? Let's open our Bible to Revelation 14, verse 12. Verse 12, it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keepeth the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Friends, we are these people. We are these saints. Are we patient? Are we worthy enough to be called the saints? To be called the saints, we must be patient of the trials and temptations of this world. Job has given us an example. Are we giving us ourselves an example? So friends, how many of us wants to be like Job? Please raise your hand. Thank you.
Shall we pray? Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your blessing that we could gather here still to praise your name. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing that you have given us an opportunity to share your word. Lord, please bless this one of us so that we may be more prayerful to you, that we may have more faith unto you, and that we may be more patient and be thankful of the trials of this world. Lord, please bless each one of us. Give us the preparation of your second coming. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing. Please bless each one of us. Please forgive our sins. In the name of our loving Jesus Christ, amen.